The Media Institute, the foremost independent advocate for the First Amendment for over four decades, is one of the nation's leading nonpartisan organizations focused on media and communications policy. The Media Institute promotes freedom of speech, recognizes excellence in journalism, and encourages a competitive media environment and communications industry. Considering the current state of affairs in the nation's capital and across the country, our mission is more relevant than ever. Thanks to our sponsors and supporters. At the Platinum level, Beasley Media Group, Charter Communications, Consumer Technology Association, iHeartMedia, LG Electronics USA, Paramount, Tegna, and Verizon. Our gold sponsors include America's public television stations, CTIA, Everything Wireless, Comcast, NBC Universal, the National Association of Broadcasters, and NCTA, the Internet and Television Association. Silver sponsors include ATSC, the Advanced Television Systems Committee, Altus USA, Cox Enterprises, Inc., DirecTV, DLA Piper, Fox Corporation, Lerman Center, PLLC, Microsoft, News Media Alliance, T-Mobile, U.S. Telecom, the Broadband Association, Wiley Ryan, LLP, and Wilkinson Barker Nauer, LLP. Thanks to all for making today's event possible. And now the President and CEO of the Media Institute, Rick Kapler. Hey, good afternoon and welcome to our Communications Forum Virtual Luncheon for March. Thank you for being with us today. I'd like to start by extending a special thank you to our luncheon sponsors. Your support makes these events possible. In fact, we wouldn't be here without you. So thank you for sponsoring our 2022 luncheon series. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to tell you about a couple of things going on here at the Institute. At the end of February, our Digital Media Center released a new paper titled Digital Media Trends to Follow in 2022, a primer on artificial intelligence and blockchain. It's written by our distinguished fellow, Stuart Brotman. It's a fascinating look at how these technologies will affect various sectors of the media industry, and it's available on our website. I hope you'll take a look at it. It won't be long before we celebrate Sunshine Week, slated this year for March 13th to the 19th. Once again, the Media Institute will be participating as we commemorate the Freedom of Information Act and continue to vigorously support open access to government records. On a related note, you might not realize that the Media Institute plays an active role in courts and government agencies around the country in support of media access and journalists' rights. In 2021, we participated in 34 friend of the court briefs, letters, and comments filed in state and federal courts, including the US Supreme Court and with local and federal government agencies. We're proud to work with the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press to support journalists and a strong First Amendment in this way. And now let's turn to our program. We got off to a great start last month with Curtis Leggett, the president and CEO of the National Association of Broadcasters. And we're equally fortunate today to welcome David Chavern, president and CEO of News Media Alliance, the news industry's leading trade organization. David joined the Alliance in 2015 and developed an entirely new brand and identity for the association. He has been intensely focused on telling the powerful and optimistic story of the news industry and fighting for a fair system of valuation and compensation for online journalism. David has been called an activist for the news industry by the national media, and that's a title he embraces proudly. Prior to joining the Alliance, David spent 10 years at the United States Chamber of Commerce, the world's largest lobbying organization. He served in senior level executive positions that included president of the Center for Advanced Technology and Innovation, and as the chamber's executive vice president and chief operating officer. David has been named a top lobbyist by The Hill and one of Washington's 250 most influential people by Washingtonian Magazine. David is a graduate of Villanova University School of Law, 
and he also holds an MBA from Georgetown University, where he was valedict valedictorian. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Pittsburgh, and he serves there today on their board of trustees. I know David has a lot to tell us about today's news industry, which is no longer just about newspapers, of course, but where online journalism has become part of a much larger digital revolution. And let me remind our viewers that during David's presentation, you'll have a chance to ask questions using the ask a question feature on your screen. Just type your questions and send them in, and we'll have a good Q&A session with David after his presentation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our distinguished speaker, Mr. David Chavern. Great, thank you very much, Rick. It's very much appreciated. I, I very much uh, uh, enjoy speaking to this group. I think it's been a few years since I did that last, and I just very much appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about what I'm super excited about, which is the news business. Um, you know, I, I am an activist for the news business, and I am uh, an optimist about the future of the news business, and I'm not a uh, irrational optimist. I think I, I'm pretty grounded, but I think there's a lot of reasons to believe in a pretty strong future uh, for news publishing. Uh, and there, uh, uh, we've already experienced a lot of difficulty, but we also are seeing the green shoots, the, the paths out of that difficulty to, uh, I think, a really powerful future. Um, I've, I, I'm probably, I don't know when I spoke to you last, four or five years ago, I was optimistic then. I'm certainly more optimistic now because we are seeing uh, our pathways out of the forest, if you will. And, you know, there's this off, too often used term of disruption. You know, industries get disrupted. Uh, the, you know, the great Clayton Christensen uh, work, Innovator's Dilemma, about what happens to disrupted industries. In a key sense, news publishing is moving into a post disruption phase or a post innovator's dilemma phase where. Uh, we've gone through, we're going through a complete re rewiring of the industry um, to a, a, a place of real growth and sustainability. What I, as part of that, let me, let me back up a little bit and talk about exactly what happened to us, because I think there's, there's often a lot of misconceptions about what did happen to the news business. Um, we were disrupted in a key, key sense, but not because of our product not because of our content. Uh, the demand for our content is higher than it's ever been by many multiples, right? This is not the buggy whip industry. People want more buggy whips than they've ever wanted. Uh, and, cert and that is true at every age group. Young people consume much more uh, hard news and journalism than we did at their ages for a bunch of reasons, but most particularly because they can, because it's available. So the audience for quality journalism is higher and more compelling and more committed than it has ever been, and certainly ever been in our lifetime. So we do not have a demand side problem, and we weren't haven't really been disrupted on the creation side. It's not like tech companies have hired a bunch of journalists to go create some new and different kind of journalism. Uh, we have, you know, at, at core. The, we have good product that has extremely high demand. So where where were we disrupted? Well, we were disrupted in terms of our distribution uh, in the print centric era. Uh, publishers had the most direct relationship you could have with a consumer. You know, we created a physical product and we walked it up your driveway and handed it to you while you're in your bathrobe. And you know, there's just there's literally no intermediaries for the most part. Well, in digital spaces, our distribution is controlled by uh, uh, digital intermediaries, in particular, a couple of big companies, Google and Facebook in particular, who decide everything about what happens to our content. The algorithms decide who get to see it, where it's ranked, where the uh, how it's presented, how it's formatted, right? how it's monetized, whether it is monetized. The intermediaries also get to extract a lot of value you uh, from uh, from the content. They tend to deny this, but it's true. Uh, people go on to their products in large part to figure out what's going on in the world. And our content satisfies that uh, desire and also allows these intermediaries to direct them to other kinds of content and serve them ads in other ways and collect data about them in other ways. So where our content feeds 
a digital intermediary system that really doesn't provide uh, sufficient value back to the creators of the content. And the analogy I always draw is to the music business. You know, in, in the 19th century, music was a print business and that it was uh, disrupted by recording devices. And there was a whole new system of value exchange through music licensing to return value back through these new systems. So we have had a we have a distribution problem that needs to be fixed. We've also had an advertising problem. We uh, the core of the economics of the industry for most of its history was selling advertising. We still do sell a lot of advertising, but digital advertising moved very dramatically to highly personalized data driven ads, ads that weren't directed at somebody like me, but ads directed immediately at me based upon what I've looked at online, my browsing history, what people know about me. So there's a huge benefits flow to the companies that have the most data and information about individuals. And that isn't news publishers, that is uh, digital intermediaries, Google, Facebook, and others who are in the data business. So, the you know the ad dollars have flowed to uh, to these data driven uh, products um, most particularly. And frankly, that that was you know that is not a world where we bring comparative advantage. But it is also a world that's changing dramatically, and I will talk a little bit more about that. So, how do we how are we dealing with these core structural problems and why do i come why am i optimistic and not optimistic just because i'm paid to be but because i really believe it um so a, a couple of key things when you're talking about the dis people taking over the distribution of our content uh we uh were early in calling for the capability for uh news publishers to organize themselves and collectively negotiate with the intermediaries for a better deal uh, you know, the, the, as we've often said, the current antitrust laws protect Google and Facebook from us. You know, we're not allowed to organize ourselves to ask for a better deal. So we've been supporting legislation in uh, Washington, the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act, that would allow news publishers to collectively negotiate with the platforms in a structured way. And you can think of it just very, in, in a very analogous way to the very earliest structural understandings of say a music licensing system or uh you know cable retrans or other times when industries have changed how the value flows uh in the industry so we we've been support we supporting some public policy uh solutions here interestingly those solutions have also been picked up by other countries there's been a lot of press around the australian bargaining code for news publishers and uh, that, by the way, has been revolutionary and has not just uh, helped uh, the largest publishers, but has helped a whole wide range of small and community publishers in Australia. The Canadian government's considering similar uh, legislation, as is the UK government. The European, um, uh, various European governments, plus the EU, uh, are following a very analogous path, the path to giving publishers new rights in the content and then a way to Neg negotiate uh, for value on those rights. So on our distribution problem, there are public policy answers and ones that I'm are optimistic are going to come about. I'm actually quite optimistic about the JCPA um, and also indicate that the fundamental value exchange between uh, digital distributors and publishers is changing and changing in a beneficial way. More value will be coming back to news publishers uh, commensurate with the value we give to the digital intermediaries. So then what about on the advertising side? Well, a couple things. First of all, advertising, for those who don't follow it, digital advertising is changing rapidly. Uh, in particular, with the advent of new uh, privacy regulation in other parts of the world, but also California and other places, but also just privacy push by companies, uh, there are new constraints coming in the collection of individualized data. And so that is gonna change the nature of that, uh, of the advertising industry. And I think ways that will benefit publishers, because again, we have really good advertising products that sit next to really compelling content where people really are deeply paying attention uh, to what we've created. So 
I, I think we're in a moment of change for the advertising industry and change in ways that will be beneficial to news publishers. We're going to be getting more advertising dollars in the future uh, than we do now. But the other kind of, and this is going to sound simple, but it's not quite revolutionary thing, is uh, the, the essentially understanding people's willingness to directly pay for news content. Uh, and what you're seeing in particular at the local level, there was a lot of skepticism about the extent to which consumers would be willing to pay for, in particular, digital news content. And what we've seen, particularly over 2020 and 2021, was there was a huge boost in people's willingness to pay for digital news content. We've actually done some research and younger people actually are more willing to subscribe and pay for content because that are systems that they grew up being used to. You pay for Netflix, for example, you pay for Disney Plus, and you also pay for access to news content. So we've seen big jumps in the willingness of people to pay more directly, reader revenue, and there's tremendous room for growth in those uh, arenas. Uh, most famously, people focus on the leader in the industry, which is the New York Times, and the New York Times has often talked about uh, you know, getting to 10 million digital subscribers. And they're right in that arena now. Um, but they also talk about their addressable market as 135 million readers. So they've got a lot of room to grow. In a very analogous way, that's true across the, uh, across the industry. Different magnitude, but true across the industry. We have just started to understand the capacity and interest of readers to pay. Now, this gets harder as you get smaller. You know, the New York Times is talking to the English speaking world. Small communities are geographically constrained. So there are challenges as you get into the more local news. Uh, and there are a lot of ideas and, and you know, I, theories about how to best address uh, the the crisis in extremely hyper local news. But overall, you have to be optimistic about understanding people's willingness to pay, uh, in particular for digital news content, much more than anybody ever expected. So uh, we're going to get the uh, distribution problems fixed through public policy. Uh, I think advertising is going to we're going to have a better future than the last couple decades. And third, we're just starting to understand people's willingness to to pay for our content. So I think on the on the revenue side, there's a lot of optimism, again, with the core understanding that people want our stuff. You know, people consume our content more than ever by many multiples. So as long as you have an audience, that's a the monetization problem is something to solve for. Now, there are a couple other things I, I, uh, I should note. You know, people often talk about the, the print product, and we love the print product. The print product is, uh, a, it is a declining business, but it's still a, a lucrative one. It still has a very rabid and loyal audience, and we're going to uh, support that audience uh, for, I think, some time to come. That being said, it is, it, that is not the strategic heart of the industry. The strategic heart of the industry is making sure we have a digital future where uh, we can not only sustain ourselves, but grow. Um, so, you know, print is uh, fine. I, li I like print myself, uh, but we also have to understand that that is a, uh, a, a overall declining business, but also, and I think people miss this, it, that is um, a high value business. That, that pays for a lot of digital transformation uh, from our print, uh, remaining print circulation. So, you know, a couple things I'll just end uh, with. Oh, I, I will note a couple other issues. We are deeply involved in a whole range of other issues relating particularly to tech policy on, uh, on antitrust and privacy and data protection. Um, Danielle Coffey, who, I th who is a committed member of your group, uh, heads our public policy efforts and is an extremely energetic advocate. Uh, for us across a whole range of different arenas. So again, in terms of an industry, we're an industry that is really moving to uh, an energetic future where we, we're we going to fight for our future and fight for uh, uh, not only the value of our content, but the right to get good value back for that content. Um, 
It is interesting, this whole idea of disruption. Uh, people tend, when they talk about news publishing, they tend to like to focus on the past. You know, they say, well, news publishers missed the boat on this or they made mistakes then. And they, that's probably, a lot of that's probably true. None of that really impacts me. I don't really care about what decisions somebody made 20 years ago about the news business. I'm in this moment now of, is our content quality content is it valuable does it have an audience and then what is the uh, what are the economic systems and business systems going forward that are going to sustain that critical business that by the way also sustains democracy just for uh, extra kicker so again i see us having gone through a valley of disruption but we're coming out the other side and i uh, am extremely uh, optimistic about our prospects uh, going forward so with that Rick, if that's uh, if that works for you, I'm happy to take any questions or talk about anything you would like to talk about. Oh, I think you're muted, Rick. Thank you. I should know that by now. Uh, thanks. Very good uh, uh, overview of what's going on, David. What has been going on? Uh, it's fascinating developments and really interesting that uh, uh, you know you say that the strategic heart of the industry is now digital. I mean, that's a big. Uh, change in thinking for, it's gonna to have to be for a lot of people to uh, you know, comprehend that. Uh, I wanna go back to something you mentioned um, on the digital uh, platforms. Mm. Um, I know that uh, News Media Alliance has been opposing new taxes on digital and print media ads. And I know there have been uh, moves afoot in some states to impose uh, advertising taxes on digital ads appearing in uh, uh, you know, publishers' websites. I think there was a bill uh, recently in Kentucky that uh, you all have opposed. Can you uh, talk about that a little bit and, and the, th uh, the, the problem or, or threat that's posed by uh, governments wanting to impose taxes on uh, digital print advertising? Yeah, I mean, we still have a vibrant ad business and uh, it sustains a lot of journalists and newsrooms. And with things like digital advertising taxes, uh, this these tend to be weapons aimed at somebody else, but who hit us disproportionately, right? They're, these tend to be driven by people who are mad at Google or Facebook or other tech behemoths, see how wealthy they are. Uh, and, uh, and also the kind of pernicious effect that the advertising systems they oversee, particularly Google, uh, how that can fund all sorts of bad and dangerous content. And so they want to get at that problem. And one idea is, oh, we're going to tax uh, this di digital advertising ecosystem. The problem is that, again, that disproportionately hits my members who are not Google or Facebook, even the biggest ones, uh, and, uh, and, it, it, and really damage our capacity to hire journalists and do great journalism. So yes, we have opposed uh, digital advertising taxes uh, because most fundamentally we would get hurt by them quite a bit and hurt disproportionately, quite frankly. Hmm. Uh, question here uh, has come in. What about uh, leveling the playing field in a different way, such as changing the section 230 exclusions for social media companies? Yeah, so we've, I've advocated for changes to section 230. Um, if you think about it, uh, First of all, news publishers are responsible for their content. And when you are creating an, uh, you know, an online news product, uh, a lot of decisions are made. You know, editors and others make decisions about uh, what's written and also what's presented to you. And my members are responsible for those decisions. They can get sued and do get sued quite regularly for, uh, for their content. Interestingly, on in the particularly the social media side or and the search side, again, lots of decisions are made about what you see, what's presented to you. Uh, and Facebook decides what you see. And by the way, my Facebook page looks a lot different than your Facebook page and Facebook makes that decision. My search page, if I search, search for news on Google, looks very different than your page when you search for news on Google. So those companies may also make billions of editorial decisions without any uh, responsibility or liability whatsoever. That is a clear inequity. Uh, now, people do say that news publishers benefit from Section 230 
really the where we do benefit is if we have comment sections or other where people are commenting on the pieces but as a in a macro that is a very minor part of our business we are responsible for the decisions we make and the platform should be responsible for the decisions they make they essentially have a, pro, a liability free products that being said and i think that's an inequity that ultimately has to be uh, addressed uh, but if you look at what is the real economic drivers, we have to deal with this dis, uh, distribution unfairness and we have to deal with, uh, you know, you know, new creating new advertising products that are privacy friendly. And, and I think, you know, that's where I spend a lot of my time. Hmm. Now, here's a question from one of our reporter friends. Um, a news Media Alliance has previously advocated legislation to protect reporters from physical attacks. Does that bill still have a path to becoming law or is that window closed? Yeah, we've we've supported that uh, that legislation for a long time and will continue to vigorously su support it. I mean, it's about protecting our our workforce fundamentally. I have to tell you, I have not gotten an update recently, Rick, on uh, the path for that legislation. So I this is one where I don't want to misspeak uh, if uh, in terms of uh, recent development. So. I'd have to get back to you or the reporter can call me for follow up and, and we'll let them know. I just I don't have the latest information on that. Hey, another uh, uh, viewer question. It's unusual that Amazon or, left, or at least uh, Jeff Bezos owns The Washington Post. Do you see other large companies making similar moves to take over newspapers? I think uh, Jeff Bezos owns The Post personally, not through Amazon, but so maybe uh, um, another way of saying that is will there be other uh rich people who see a, a a path toward buying newspapers you know i have a number of uh my members who are owned by wealthy individuals and people uh know the washington post but you can you know the the boston globe or minneapolis star tribune or the la times and they are great owners fantastic owners um but you know, one thing you have to understand is that those tend not, no owners I'm aware of uh, see it as a continuing philanthropic subsidy, right? They may not be looking to make a lot of money in this space, but they want the business to be self-sustaining and they should make it self-sustaining. So at the end of the day, whether you have wealthy owners or not, it's, it's some level of stability is nice, but we still have to solve these core problems. And there is no unending um, fountain of uh, of rich person money that's going to you know cover over all these other problems. And by the way, there shouldn't need to be. We sh we create something of high value, so we should uh, legitimately get high value back for it. So I like our uh, wealthy owners; uh, they're great. I don't know that that's a systemic solution to things like our distribution problems and the advertising markets. Mm. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Journalism Competition and Preservation Act. And do you think that's something you can get uh, bipartisan support for? I know um, I was reading that at least uh, one Republican uh, member of Congress uh, referred to the news publishers in the context of this bill as a cartel, which is not a good sign. Um, and the critics have said that the uh, um, uh, doing this would drive up the cost of uh, platforms for the platforms that might have to start charging for searches or for access. So uh, uh, do you think there's bipartisan support out there and how do you answer some of these criticisms? Oh, there we already have bipartisan support and there's gonna be more of it coming. I mean, we've got uh, in the house, for example, our original co-sponsors were David Cicilline and Ken Buck and, and Ken Buck is a, a pretty conservative uh, congressman. and. Uh, in the Senate, we've had uh, Senator Klobuchar and Senator John Kennedy from Louisiana. Again, Senator Kennedy is a pretty conservative guy. What they see is a fundamental unfairness uh, between the uh, overwhelming power of the tech platforms and this uh, comparatively smaller industry that is nonetheless critically important to their communities. It turns out that Republicans care about uh, news in their communities, uh, like Democrats, is extremely bipartisan uh, uh, effort. So, uh, you like with any legislation, you're going to get crazy criticisms. Uh, some of this is funded by people who don't want the legislation to go through. The idea that we would create a 
cartel, uh, the most absurd term ever, that would somehow raise prices in the face of uh, the overwhelming uh, economic might of a company like Google is the most ridiculous and absurd on its face uh, co comment ever. Again, you know, think about it. the current antitrust laws protect Google and Facebook from us. Uh, so there's an irony there that I think we as a society have to address. So, uh, yeah, listen, I don't I don't remember the last piece of legislation went through uh, that was unanimous, uh, and this certainly won't be. But we have good bipartisan support because uh, they see the inequity and they see the importance of their communities. Hmm. And even I guess maybe one of the uh, strongest objections has been that it would create an antitrust uh, exemption for publishers to negotiate uh, collectively that way. Um, and, you know, the uh, mood at the FTC seems to have been changing in recent times. And uh, do you see that as a uh, possible or maybe the main roadblock here? Or uh, is that something that can be uh, circumvented? No, I mean, that, I don't see that a roadblock at all. Um, again, it is you're kind of playing it, not you, but I mean, we are kind of playing into somebody's hands where they want to equate uh, our market power to that. <laughs> To that of singular, uh, massive, uh, completely dominant uh, tech platforms. I mean, it's kind of an absurd uh, comparison. I mean, what they, what people see is an industry, my industry, that again sustains communities. Uh, if we don't have the industry, if we didn't have it for whatever reason, uh, we would be much worse off in every respect. Professional journalism sustains uh, civic society. Facts sustain civic society in this fact challenge world. So uh, what they see is a critically important industry that is just getting jammed um, and uh, getting the value extracted from it by dominant platforms. And, you know, we have, you know, the, we have to figure out a way to fix this, to balance this out. And by the way, you're seeing them balance it out in other uh, parts of the world. Again, I've talked about the Australia news bargaining code. Turns out that uh, that didn't destroy the internet or other, it, there was no link tax, other, you know, other kind of crazy references. Uh, and the internet kept going and the world kept revolving and news publishing is sustained in Australia. And, uh, and that's a solution that has to be replicated in other places, including here. Hmm. No question from one of our viewers. Do you think younger people appreciate the value of journalism and do they appreciate that big tech doesn't typically employ journalists? No, you know, one of the problems with having the the digital intermediaries is uh, essentially our brand, our presence gets stripped out. You know, if people say, I, re you know, I read this piece on Facebook where Facebook, by the way, has the relationship with the reader. Facebook collects the data about the reader. Facebook monetizes that reader. And the reader thinks that Facebook wrote it. <laughs> that is... That is one of the uh, challenges faced by the industry. One of the ways that Facebook extracts value out of the content without compensating us. And that is a problem. And that's because we're, we're jammed uh, in their world where they get to say what the rules are and they get to see how it's presented. So yeah, that is a, uh, I think, do I think young people care about quality journalism? Yes, I think they're, all evidence shows they consume it way more than we ever did again, because it shows up on their phones constantly. Um, but do they understand always where it comes from and the processes and frankly, the expense? Our content is expensive. And uh, I'll tell you, sorry, Rick, I was on a, a panel one time with somebody who represented uh, musicians and uh, they said, you know, we, we, we got to get better compensation for the musicians, but we understand that even if they didn't get paid, you know, probably musicians would still make music. And my response was, that's awful, right? Musicians should get paid for their, for their, uh, uh, for what they produce, uh, the, the uh, outcome of their efforts. Uh, but also, let's just be clear, there's no such thing as a free news business, right? Reporters, uh, reporters need to, professional reporters uh, need to be paid. And so we create an expensive kind of content and we need a good value system to sustain that content. Mm -hmm. Now, what about uh, non-publisher sources for local news? Efforts by Patch and services like Bethesda Beat, published by the Slick Local Lifestyle magazine, the viewer writes. And uh, 
continues to say they do a decent job of writing or curating hyper local news, often much better and faster than the Washington Post. Is that a, you see that as a growing trend or? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of experiments going on in the hyper local side. Uh, the uh, I, I don't believe that the answer is volunteers, right? I, I don't I don't I just I, I at the end of the day, if you want quality, you have to pay for quality. You can't assume that that will be free because somebody's uh, is willing to do it for free at a professional journalism standard. That being said, it is true that particularly hyper local is uh, is the clear, clearest example of the these economic problems because you know their audience, their addressable market isn't one hundred thirty five million. It might be a thousand. Um, I used to be on the city council in Falls Church, where the you know the city of Falls Church had about ten thousand people. So so the you know the the challenge is there, but I think you still need at least journalists who get value for what they create. I think there are a whole range of models about where can we get both reader revenue from the from the readers and also things like philanthropic and foundation support uh, to sustain these hyper local systems. But that is the kind of hardest problem in this industry. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about the, the role of hedge funds. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot in the press lately, and in fact, a piece on 60 Minutes last Sunday about uh, the role of hedge funds in buying up newspapers, even some you know, large newspapers, and slashing the newsroom staff, selling off real estate, selling off assets, all for the bottom line, rather than um, you know, for the sake of perpetuating good journalism. Uh, how do you see that, and how, how significant is that uh, phenomenon at this point in the disruption process, you might say. Yeah, I mean, listen, there are there are all sorts of different owners in any industry, in particular in this business, and people can c complain about some set of owners versus the other. Did they cut back too much? I the at the end of the day, I don't think our biggest problem is the publishers. If we changed everybody out and put in whatever your dream publisher was, you know, made Jeff Bezos the owner of all the all the papers in America, I think you still have these core uh, economic problems where our content is treated badly and unfairly and value is extracted from it. So I, uh, at, at the end of the day, I encourage all publishers to invest in content creation because that's the business we're in now. We we sell great content to people and that's what the future of the business is, is going to be. So I, it, I, listen, there's always going to be uh, people that folks like or don't like. I don't think that's the biggest challenge we have to the industry right now. Again, because I don't think the nature of the publisher is our biggest problem. Hmm. I thought it was interesting uh, during your talk, you were talking about the, uh, uh, that you see that there's been a huge boost in people's willingness to pay for online content. And uh, the, this whole question of monetization, because back in the early days of, of online journalism, I think it was pretty much the New York Times and Wall Street Journal that were charging for content, and they were kind of the outliers. Everyone else thought that you had to pretty much give it away for free if you were going to get any viewers. Um, so what what's changed? It's got to be more than um, Netflix or any one one other uh, you know uh, model out there that has caused people to suddenly or not suddenly, but um, over time here, get the idea that they really should be paying for this online content. Yeah, it's, it's two things. First of all, in the, in the early days of the internet, everybody, and by the way, everybody, including a bunch of people who gave, turned out to be bad advice to the news business, said, oh, this is going to be great because you have an advertising business now in your local print paper. Now, digitally, there's going to be way more people who can see your content and you're going to serve them advertising and isn't that isn't that going to be great you should just go for the biggest audience so don't charge anybody and you're going to serve them all these great ads and isn't that going to be wonderful the the problem that nobody fully under, appreciated at the time was that the advertising business moved from i want to reach the most number of people possible to I want to just reach the people who will be impacted by my ads, you know, the, and this is a really hard concept for people from outside the industry to get because they still think of advertising as, you know, I'm reaching a million people's got to be better than reaching 10,000 people. 
but really the the way the uh the the market evolved is people was like no no i just want to reach the ten thousand that really matter i don't want to pay for the million anymore and that really benefited the the big tech platforms google and facebook in particular so the original ideas about the advertising markets were wrong but people figured that out over, over time and then you had and quite frankly part of it was what happened in 2020 and 2021 where there had been this was an internet phenomenon, nationalization of news attention. All of a sudden, people are paying a lot more attention to national and general interest stories than they would have. You know, the it, uh, Nixon would have been pretty far down the news funnel for my parents, right? They would have been local, local Nixon. Internet changed all of that. In particular, President Trump was a, you know, it was all Trump down the news funnel for a while. But interestingly, both with COVID and the racial justice um, reckoning that we've been going through, there's been a real reattachment of people to local. All of a sudden, the telescope has been spun around and people care what's happening. You know, they care what their mayor said about COVID or uh, racial justice issues when before they may have had no idea who their mayor was. So it's been a reattachment to local. And as part of that, you've seen people really willing to pay for quality uh, local news and content but again we got a long way to go because our penetration rates in almost every market are very low i want to ask you uh, what, do, what do you think about the role for uh, nonprofit journalism you know there are a lot of groups out there some have been around for for decades actually like the center for investigative reporting and ProPublica and a number of others that provide uh, news content for outlets and, and many local outlets um, Will they have a, you see them having a growing uh, prominence in uh, in the face of the other changes happening in newsrooms or um, uh, how, how do they fit into this new new reality? Yeah, I, I have a number of nonprofits in my membership and they're great. I think it's a business model choice. I don't think profit taking has been the biggest challenge to the industry over the last 20 years. Uh, you know, the... The joke has been it's been nonprofit, whether you liked it or not, uh, which is not entirely true. But, you know, again, uh, I think it's great. And if that works for the uh, particular uh, news outlet, I don't think it's an answer, particularly for anything. Again, that sort of centers the discussion on if only we had these kind of publishers, then all this other stuff would be wonderful. That's not the case. And even nonprofits, first of all, you have to go get money and you need advertising revenue and you need reader revenue. You, you need a you know, multi-level sustainable system. So I think they're fine, but just like having the idea of having billionaires own the industry, that's not a, that's not a singular model that solves all of our problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, David, this has been very fascinating. Uh, I think we're about uh, running up on our time limit here, but I want to thank you for giving us such a good overview of what's happening in the industry and, and giving us this optimistic sense of, uh, uh, of what where the industry is at these days and the digital future and and uh, I, you know, I guess probably those of you know like you're being right in the middle of the industry you have already um, you know gotten used to this idea of digital being the heart of the news news industry going forward and you know I think there are probably a lot of people out there that that's realization is coming a little slower to. But uh, I, you know, we're all going to have to get there one one day or, or sooner or later. So mm -hmm. anyway, okay. I want to thank you for a great presentation. It's been great to have you back here. Uh, so much has changed since the last time you were with us, and we're glad to to get this update and to and to see where things stand. So thanks for a very very enlightening presentation. Great, and thank you for having me. It was a great opportunity, and good to see you again, Rick. Much appreciated, David. It. Thank you. So I want to. I really uh, give our thanks to David Chavern for being with us today and thanks to our out outstanding sponsors and a special thanks to Dave Arland and his team at Arland Communications for producing today's event. And I want to thank all of our, our viewers with us today and thank you for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you back here next time. Thank you to our guest speaker today. Thank you to the Navy Band and a big thank you again to our sponsors. We'll see you next month.